Hello, everybody, and thank you all for being here to this wonderful event that WCN has put together for us. My name is Rocio Palacios, and I am the General Coordinator of the Andean Cat Alliance, a great group of people that work together for the conservation of this beautiful small cat, the Andean Cat. The Andean Cat is considered endangered because less than 1,400 mature individuals still roam in the wild. This makes this species the most endangered wildcat in the American continent. As most cats, it has always been surrounded by a halo of mystery. But this particular species was considered sacred by native communities in the past. It was considered the protector of the mountain. And it was usually depicted as in relation to magical figures like a shaman in this pictography. But you know, times have changed. And even the most isolated communities nowadays are connected. But this is a good thing. At the beginning of the pandemic, because of this connectivity, we were able to contact the communities we work with and we were able to provide them the basic supplies they needed to protect themselves. The downside of the connectivity is that it, you know, it can create real or perceived needs that may affect how they perceive the landscapes. The Andes landscape is usually very uh, bare. It's not highly productive, and they, this, they may perceive this as worthless. This in turn leads to them leaving their lands and leaving it open for extractive industries to do business there. This is the main threat for Andean cat conservation. The, uh, environmental damage that extractive industries can create is not just the local damage, it's also the polluting of the watersheds that is very, very important in this very dry landscape. Another very important threat for Andean cat conservation in some other parts of the distribution is hunting. In some areas, all carnivores are being persecuted because of the damage that only a couple of species can create attacking livestock. Uh, in these particular places, people hunt all carnivores just in case. But there's a very important thing that we need to understand here. These people don't really want to leave their lands. They don't enjoy killing carnivores. They still have a very, very deep and strong bond with the land that is just below the surface and needs very small encouragement to thrive. This is when the term coexistence comes to mind. And we have all heard this word probably a lot of times, but what does it really mean? So the definition of coexistence is to, uh, is the state or fact of living or existing at the same time or in the same place. Sounds very easy. And sounds very plain, but every living creature that has ever lived with another living thing know how challenging it can truly be. As an example, I'm going to give you 10 minutes of my life in my house. Coexistence is all usually associated with words like peace, peaceful, and harmonic, but it's not all about that. It has ups and downs, good times, others that are not so good, some that are just unforgettable. It's basically what we have all been doing for the past seven months, living together, working together, homeschooling, and not killing one another. But the key thing here is what, what do we do for make coexistence a positive thing? We listen. We listen to each other's needs and we find ways to provide for each other. In conservation, this means to actively listen to the people. Our PhDs, um, the papers we read or published are not really important when you're talking with a herder that is suffering from puma attacks that are decimating their scarce livestock. So at this point, we need to realize that we cannot provide a magic solution we need to listen to what they really need to make it happen. And bringing all of this back to the Andean cat, 
to our beautiful small cat? How do we facilitate coexistence for a species that is somewhere in between an anecdote and a legend? Well, it's not easy, let me tell you that. But today I want to invite you through a trip to the Andes to learn or to share with you some of the approaches we are already implementing to make it happen. But first, we need to get their bearings. So the Andean cat, it lives in the high Andes, all the way from central Peru, through Bolivia, Chile, and into Argentina, where it also opens to North Patagonia. So our first stop in our trip is gonna be in a very beautiful community in Southern Peru. Here, in a landscape of outstanding beauty, where the high mountain peak seems to whisper in the silence and the air is so clear that you will never believe it, lives a community of artisans that raised llamas and alpacas for their survivals. With the alpaca wool, they, they create these beautiful handcrafts and the llamas they use for consumption. This community, they already have a very strong bond with the landscape and they consider themselves the, the guardian of the Andean cat. They created a whole collection of handcrafts inspired by the cat. And just to show you how strong this bond is, I want to introduce you to this lady, Ines, She's a community leader and also who coordinates the artisans uh, cooperative. And when we met a couple of months ago to discuss different measures that we could implement together to uh, facilitate coexistence with Pumas, she told us uh, a story that I want to share with you. Por ejemplo, a mí yo le cuento una historia cuando yo me he ido a pastear por, por Quiscapuro y mi llama se ha subido hasta arriba, me ha ganado. Entonces, pero cuando he ido a alcanzarle, ya le he visto al puma ya llevándose uno. Entonces, yo ya de susto ya no le he seguido ni nada. Llegado a mi casa y a mi papá le cuento y mi papá me dice, ya pues ya te quitó uno, pues ya también tienes que comer, pues, ¿no? Tiene que comer, entonces, uno, ¿qué te va a hacer? Nada. Ya pasimos, y o sea, siempre nos ha quitado uno, dos, hasta tres en un año. Pero de ahí, lo que nos da más miedo es que se, se eh, siga acercando más al corral de noche y que nos mate, a ver, once, doce o veinte cabezas en una sola noche, eso sí, o sea, sí nos va a doler. Es veinte, ya pues el trabajo de un año. There's nothing really that we can teach them about coexistence. Actually, in the Andean Cat Alliance, we are honored to be able to help them find better tools to make coexistence easier. So now we go to our next, our next stop that is in Northern Bolivia. Here, there is a community of miners that extract gold using traditional techniques. This cooperative uh, also has a very strong bond with the landscape, as you can imagine. And they actually selected a group of species to act as their flagship species for conservation purposes. And one of those species was the Andean cat. So they approached us, you know, looking for ways to uh, ensure the permanence of these species in their lands. So at the beginning, we, we kind of had some ideas, you know, but we wanted to know how deep the connection was. And when asked about coexistence, uh, Remigio Mendo, a miner and cooperativist, shared with us his views that I also want to share with you now. Para nosotros es uno de los valores más grandes que existe eh, los animales silvestres en este sector. La cooperativa Águilas de Oro y yo particularmente hemos sido 
muy amigos de la fauna silvestre. En pocas palabras, es el valor más grande que existe sobre la faz de la Tierra, que sin ellos eh, estaríamos falto de valores en el sector de la cooperativa, cooperativa Águilas de Oro. Lacking in principles. That's quite intense, isn't it? So when we approached this community, we had some ideas about what needed to be done for conservant the academy sector. We selected a couple of uh, areas of land and we located some signs um, that will raise awareness of the species. But because we were active listening and we create a safe space for the community to speak with us, another threat arises that is uh, feral dogs. Now we are designing a trap neuter return program that we expect to be able to implement as soon as the pandemic allow us that will reduce this threat. I hope you are not bored yet. We still have two more stops to make. For our next stop, we have to go all the way to Northern Argentina, flying over the Titicaca Lake in Bolivia and arriving at a small town that seems to have been forgotten by time. In this small bunch of adobe houses is called Lagunillas del Farallón. And here we have developed the handcraft program. In this site where Time has really depends more on sunsets and sunrises than on watches and alarms. Uh, there's a community of artisans that, as a main difference from the other communities that we spoke before, they had no idea about the relevance of the undercat. They didn't have this ancestral bond with the species as other community, communities had. So for them, developing this handcraft not only provided uh, uh, an alternative income source, but also it was an opportunity for them to learn about what's relevant about, relevant about this species, why the physical adaptations the cat has allows the species to thrive in the rocky cliffs, and what is the ecological role of the ending cat in the ecosystem. This is very important because they realized that they were, uh, the, their surroundings were containing treasures that they were not expecting there. For our final stop, we have a special guest. We have to go all the way through Argentina to North Patagonia. And here, I want to introduce you to Dr. Maria Jose Volgeri, alias Mako. Mako obtained her PhD in the uh, University of Bariloche in Argentina, and she has been working in the field for over 20 years. I met her several years ago in the Andes, and she impacted me as a very strong person, uh, but very sensitive and calm too. For me, it was also surprising her stamina. It was her first time in the Andes, and she was running around as a mountain viscacha, oblivious of the lack of oxygen and the elevation. Uh, it's real an honor to me for me to introduce her to you uh, today. And is, there is one good thing that I can take out of this virtual expert that she can share the stage with us today. Uh, with all of you, Maria Jose Volgeri. Hola, yo soy Mako. Les cuento que llegué a este lugar hace algunos años para realizar mi doctorado y cambié mi vida a orillas del mar por este paisaje de cordillera andina y estepa patagónica. Desde chica me gustó el campo y los animales, y acá pude tener ese contacto cotidianamente. En esta región existe un gran problema con los carnívoros silvestres y hay una alta intolerancia de los productores hacia ellos. Cuando uno inicia un vínculo o una conversación con un productor, lo primero que surge es el desprecio hacia los carnívoros en general. En parte esto ocurre porque en toda la Patagonia Argentina las poblaciones de pumas han comenzado a um, recuperarse luego de haber sido eliminadas casi hasta la extinción por la producción ovina. Y esto es una gran noticia para nosotros y nos alegra, pero realmente para los productores es un gran problema 
productores que basan su economía familiar en unos pocos animales y que van reduciendo su capital por los frecuentes ataques del puma. Y lo que ocurre es que para controlar estos ataques, los productores cazan, cazan de manera ilegal. Cazan con perros, cazan con armas, cazan con trampas y hasta utilizan veneno. Y el problema del veneno es muy grave porque no solo afecta a las especies blanco, sino que también afecta a la comunidad de carroñeros. Hace dos años se encontraron aquí 32 cóndores andinos muertos por envenenamiento, por haber, por haber comido en una carcasa envenenada y dejada allí para pumas. De hecho, de los registros de gato andino que hay en esta región, casi el 50% pertenecen a gatos muertos como consecuencia de este problema. Esto me hizo pensar que la ciencia es muy importante, pero para hacer conservación es necesaria la ciencia, pero también es necesaria la gestión, es necesaria las acciones directas y es necesario estar en el territorio. Hace algunos años, junto con WSS y mis compañeros del programa de mitigación de conflictos de la Alianza Gato Andino, que cruzaron eh, los Andes y me trajeron dos perras criadoras de razas protectoras, creamos, desarrollamos un criadero de perros protectores, acá en mi casa. Y bueno, sí, ahora en mi casa tengo unas chivas, tengo unas ovejas y tengo unos cachorros adorables. Así dice mi hija, son unos cachorros adorables, a los cuales no puedo acariciar mucho ni puedo tener mucho contacto directo porque ellos deben mantener y generar un vínculo familiar y estrecho con el ganado. Entonces, todos los días por cuatro meses me levanto, me pongo las botas, me pongo la campera y voy hacia el corral, alimento a esos cachorros, al ganado, Hago limpieza del corral, superviso que esté el alimento y transcurrido ese tiempo y una vez que finalizamos el calendario sanitario y que los cachorros son castrados, comenzamos el proceso de entrega a los productores. La selección de los productores es clave porque no solo es necesario que estén en los sitios de presencia de gato andino, sino que además se deben comprometer asegurar el bienestar del cachorro y se deben comprometer a no matar felinos silvestres. Además, tienen que dejarnos acompañarnos por un periodo de 12 meses para que aseguremos que cada perro que nosotros dejamos en el campo llegue a ser un buen protector de ganado y un aliado para la conservación. Yo espero poder seguir trabajando en esto Espero poder seguir viendo las caritas de esos cachorros todos los días y depositar mi esperanza de poblaciones de gato andino silvestre saludables en cada plato de comida, en cada limpieza de corral, en cada corrida al veterinario ante una urgencia y en cada cuidado que en este caso no se manifiesta tanto en besos y abrazos. Y de a poco... Muy de a poco hay pequeñas cosas que van ocurriendo, que van demostrando que hay nuevas miradas. De los cachorros que hoy están trabajando en el campo, eh, me sorprende por el vínculo que han generado con, con los productores y para mí es algo inesperado. Pero cómo no va a ser de otra manera si esos perros están cuidando la sustentabilidad de una familia. Hoy me sorprendo al llegar a las casas de los productores y que ya las, las anécdotas de muerte y de odio hacia los carnívoros no sea el centro de la conversación, sino que sea las hazañas y las manias de esos perros protectores que la gente cuida con tanto amor. Y eso... Me hace pensar que como seres humanos tenemos la capacidad de cambiar los pensamientos. Y entonces creo, ahí es cuando creo, que la coexistencia entre la fauna silvestre y las personas es posible. I told you, she's awesome. You know what? 
this year it was really challenging to put together a presentation. After being away from the field for such a long time, away from the communities and away from the cats and the wildlife, it was hard. But at those times, I remember people like her. Mako, from her part of the world, managed to find a way to raise a litter of seven puppies that will facilitate coexistence for Andean cat in North Patagonia, even under strict lockdown. And I also remember videos like this one of beautiful Andean cats doing cat things in one of the most fantastic landscapes on earth. And this makes me realize that for us in conservation, coexistence means a lot, something a lot more deep and profound than what the dictionary says. It means hope for a better future. It means survival of this endangered species. And so I believe that there's only one way to exist, and that is to coexist. To exist with others. So I invite you from wherever you are in the world to exist with others peacefully, no matter the color or the species. We can still make this a better planet for us all. Thank you so much for being there.